a good evening. Thanks for joining us for this presentation by the Agency for Public Information. The Agency for Public Information is charged with the responsibility of bringing you an in-depth look at the plans, programs, and policies of the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm Hala John. On this evening's program, we focus on recent improvements to elderly care facilities across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Then we take a visit to early childhood education centers in South Rivers and Cane End. Then we take a critical look at the process of mediation in dispute resolution. This informative package continues after Newswatch with Nadia Slater. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Newswatch. I am Nadia Slater. We begin our top story in health. As this country expands its policies and measures in the area of geriatrics, taking care of the well-being of our aging population is priority for the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Cuthbert Knights, says that while the state has a role to play in this area, people must not altogether abandon their loved ones and neglect their own responsibilities to their family members. I have observed a practice where we tend to fall away from taking care of our elderly. I am not saying that this is a generalized practice. Maybe it is done by the minority segment of the population, but <clears throat> it is not a practice which um, it is not a practice which is in keeping with the way in which we live and our own civilization. Because we tend to take care of our elderly in our homes, but we are seeing now where persons are leaving their loved ones at the health facilities at our hospitals, persons are being left to take care of themselves at an old age when they really can't do it. I'm appealing to us and to our good nature and to our common sense to understand that we have a responsibility to take care of our loved one when they are at an age where they cannot take care of themselves. And we will have more on the development of geriatric care later on the program. The Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit, WIDU, has partnered with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to host a national consultation on the Third Growth and Resilience Dialogue Action Plan for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It was held today at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Conference Room. Director of the Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit, Ambassador Alan Alexander, says the growth dialogue is a very important conversation on both national and regional levels. At the 86th meeting of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Monetary Council held in October 2016, a decision was made to host the first Growth and Resilience Forum with, with social partners from across the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. This event was held in March 2017 in St. Kitts Nevis under the theme, Working Together to Achieve Higher and more inclusive growth in the ECCU. It provided a unique opportunity for civil and social partners to dialogue with the Eastern Caribbean Monetary Council on matters of growth within the ECCU. Advisor for the Strategic Planning and Projects Department at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Daniel Atherton, welcomed and acknowledged all stakeholders at the seminar. Atherton described the dialogue as a process of inclusion. And I know St. Vincent has had significant challenges with floods and that sort of thing where you have lost significant um, proportion of your GDP. So it is in this kind of environment that one, we are vulnerable on one hand and we have to build resilience. And since we no longer get compassionate con concessionary aid because they say we are in a bracket we are middle-income countries and we no longer qualify for um, aid. We have to we rely only on ourselves to survive. We have to go back to the roots. So 
With these things in mind, I think it is important that we bring it to the fore, we discuss them, we understand the importance of this from a national level. It's about national development. It's about m putting things in place in harmony with our national plans, with all of the strategic partners for the benefit of all. We move on to education. Seven schools recorded pass rates of 80% or more at this year's CSEC examinations. The St. Vincent Girls High School, the St. Vincent Grammar School, the Beckwith Seven-day Adventist School, the St. Martin's Secondary School, the St. Joseph's Convent Kingstown, the Mountain View Adventist Academy, and the St. Joseph's Convent Mario Corps all recorded over 80% passes. According to a report from the Ministry of Education, the Beckway Seven-day Adventist School and the West St. George Secondary School showed vast improvement in their performances at this year's CSEC examinations. In 2018, the Beckway Seventh-day Adventist School recorded a pass rate of 74.71% and the West St. George Secondary School recorded a pass rate of 64.68%. In 2019, the Beckway Seventh-day Adventist School pass rate increased to 88.57% and the West St. George Secondary School pass rate rose to 78.24%. These figures represent an increase of 13.86% and a 13.56%. 0.56% respectively. The vessel Simon Boulevard visited St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2017 and will again arrive here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on August 17th. Vincentians will have four days to visit the ship and learn about its history. It will be opened from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. daily. Head of Mission at the Embassy of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Francisco Perez Santana, says all these years the vessel has been used to train new naval cadets in sailing, not only with modern technology, but how it was done years before. The vessel is visiting a few countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And finally on Newswatch. Former Member of Parliament and Opposition Leader, the late Sir Vincent Beach, will be accorded a state funeral on Monday, August 19. Official viewing of the body will begin at 9 in the morning at the House of Assembly. Officials will be invited to view the body from 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. and the general public from 9.45 to 1 p.m. The funeral service will take place at 2 p.m. at the Kingston Methodist Church, followed by the internment at the Kingston Cemetery. All flags throughout the state will be flown at half-mast throughout the day. Sir Vincent died on August 5th at his home after a period of illness. Sir Vincent Beach entered politics in 1972. He was the former parliamentary secretary in the Ministry of Trade and Agriculture from 1975 to 1978 under the St. Vincent Labour Party government. From March 1978 to April 1984, Sir Vincent Beach served as Minister of Trade and Agriculture and also a member of parliament for North Central Windward. That's it for our Newswatch segment. The APR presentation continues, so stay with us. If you can believe this, why can't you believe this? Uncle tried to make me have sex. Some mothers don't believe their own children when they say they've been sexually abused and they don't report it. Remember, if anyone asks to see or touch their private parts, touches them inappropriately, shows them or forces them to touch one's private parts, has sex with them, shows them pornographic material, or deliberately lets them hear or see the act of sex, then it is sexual abuse. Believe your child and report the sexual abuse. For more information about child abuse, contact these agencies. This message brought to you by UNICEF and this station. Thanks for staying with us. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is taking additional steps to look after the well-being of the elderly and vulnerable within our society. Apart from the Home Help for the Elderly program, a refurbished temporary facility for patients at the Louis Bonnet Home is almost complete. We hear more in the following report. For too long, the conditions at the Louis Bonnet Home have been a stain on the collective conscience of all Vincentians. All right. 
the need for sections of our aging and geriatric population to, ac to access quality residential health care services is self-evident. It is similarly self-evident that such services cannot be delivered within the constraints of the existing Lewis Punet home. This budget therefore provides $2.1 million for the construction of a temporary facility at the site of the former nurses' hostel. After the patients are relocated to this temporary facility, we shall demolish and reconstruct a new Lewis Punet home, befitting the dignity of our most vulnerable elderly Vincentians. It is a deliberate policy and effort of the state to ensure that our elderly are taken care of in a manner which is in keeping with the best accommodation, the best care, the best treatment that can be provided. In other words, it is not becoming of us and of our civilization to have our elderly existing in substandard. And the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has delivered on that promise. Within a matter of a few months, patients of the Lewis Punnett home will be relocated to a more spacious, secure and comfortable accommodation at the former nurses' hostel in Stony Ground. Alistair Brown is a senior technical officer in the Ministry of Transport and Works. Him and his team are on schedule for the completion of the renovation projects. On the project, um, I'm also supported by a team of electrical engineer, architects, mechanical engineer, and structural engineers. Currently, we are catering for approximately 60-something um, patient, combination of both gender, male, female, um, so this is where we're standing here now is the male block. We have the female block and an admin block directly opposite the, the female block. It's a project that costs approximately $2 million. We are now midway into the budget of the project. Um, and to date, the project is expected to be completed by October 27th. So thus far we are on schedule. Based on how things are going, as you will see that we are now painting. We have a few works to be done on the external works. And then the project would be completed for, for October. The project is being done on the, the Fraser's construction, alias um, Punti. He is the one that won the contract for the project. The building that we are standing in now, this is a new building, a completely new building, the male block. The female block, which is this building over here, that's a building that was renovated. That used to be the building that was used as the kitchen for the hospital at one time. The admin building used to be the storage building for the Ministry of Health. That is now the, the, admin, the admin block for the, the staff on the facility. So in terms of staffing, um, the government has put a provision for staffing for the Lewis Bennett home into the estimate and um, there are sufficient staffing it's comprised of nurses staff nurses um, nursing aides nursing assistants um, there are the, the orderlies um, we even have a visiting doctor that goes by does the check and ensure these people are well taken care of so long and short is that there there is adequate staffing um, which is provision for in their summit um, to actually take care and to provide the service which is required at the at the at the Lewis Burnett home. Moving from the Lewis Burnett home to these renovated quarters entails more than just moving to better conditions, but providing adequate and quality care for the residents, from physical health to mental health and well-being. We are speaking here 
about, as I said, um, not just a physical building, but providing a quality service to the aged. And it requires money. It requires trained staff. It requires supplies, medical supplies. And these things are very important. And um, what we need to realize to that, a lot of the persons, the aged people who are at the homes, that's really their home. Some of them lived there for years, never to go back. So <laughs> actually it's a way of life as well. So we have to understand that um, because they're there, because it's their home, we also have to be able to make them comfortable, have programs in place to occupy them so that they can live a normal life as they would have as if they were in their own private homes. The Permanent Secretary noted that government's commitment to the delivery of quality geriatric care is noted with the Home Health for the Elderly program, which meets the needs of the poor and vulnerable at their homes. And this again is in keeping with the policy of the government to really and truly ensure that our elderly are well taken care of. So in addition to that, there is that program which persons are trained and persons go into the homes of the elderly to help in taking care of them. So this is a significant point because the state, the government is really doing extensive work, is really and truly ensuring that um, the requisite arrangement, provision, strategies are put in place to ensure this. And as a result of that, it behoves us more as citizens to really and truly step up to the plate and, and play our part. As I said, there's a geriatric home, there's a home help for the elderly, and it lends tremendous assistance to persons who need this support in their homes. And persons are trained at the expense of the state, and persons are also paid a stipend. So, I mean, we can see that much is happening in terms of the care for the care for our elderly. And as a result of that, that is why we are saying that we should be able to step up and do more when it comes to the care for our elderly. As people begin to live longer, it is important that the state puts policies and services in place to take care of its aging population. And the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is cognizant of this fact. Now, taking care of the elderly or providing accommodation for the elderly is not just erecting a building and staffing it. It's about providing also a quality type of care for people who have attained a certain age. So we are speaking here about, as I said, um, not just a physical building, but providing a quality service to the aged. And it requires money. It requires trained staff. It requires supplies, medical supplies. And these things are very important. And um, what we need to realize to that, a lot of the persons, the aged people who are at the homes, that's really their home. When the relocation of the patients of the Lewis Punnett home takes place in October, government will erect a brand new state-of-the-art facility at Glen. Nadi Slater reporting for the API. More from the API after the break. A lot goes into shaping an individual, but it all starts here. What may seem to us like simple fun is critical to their education and overall development. It's how they start to define and understand the speech, how they develop their motor skills and hand-eye coordination. Remember, children are never too young to learn. This message was brought to you by the UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, the Caribbean Child Support Initiative, and this station. Welcome back. Vincentians are being encouraged to look at the option of court-connected mediation for dispute resolution. One of the benefits of mediation is preserving relationships that are oftentimes strained during disputes. The API's Kathy Rose spoke with members of the legal fraternity and in particular a professional mediator about the process and its benefits to the general public. Court-connected mediation is an alternative mode of dispute resolution in which parties have recourse to an impartial third party, the mediator. 
It offers an alternative mechanism for the settlement of disputes in an efficient, fair, timely and confidential manner. To discuss this topic further is Her Ladyship Honorable Justice Esco Henry, Registrar Andrea Young, and Simon Kamara, a mediator. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Rose. I will start with you, Justice Esco Henry, to give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much for having us here. We are most grateful that you have taken up the opportunity to give us this platform in which to launch I believe the first of a series of talks about court connected mediation. Court connected mediation is an initiative of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, which serves nine independent states and territories in the subunion. Court connected mediation was launched about 15 years ago in 2003. It serves several objectives, including one, affording residents an opportunity to settle disputes among them in a cordial, conciliatory, less informal, and less costly manner than in a court setting. And secondly, it serves to reduce the backlog of civil cases in the court system. Very significantly, court-connected mediation benefits the entire society in that when residents are able to resolve their disputes amicably and in a timely manner, it augurs well for harmonious relationships within the entire society. Thank you. Ms. Young? Yes. I would just like to reiterate a point made by Ms. Rose in your very introduction and Justice Henry that mediation is, an, is a form of dispute resolution that has been uh, sanctioned by the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and was introduced in St. Vincent's and the Grenadines in 2004. It is governed by a practice direction issued by the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and has been practiced in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as I said, since 2004. Um, a matter that is before the court can be referred to mediation as well as parties may voluntarily agree that they wish to have their disputes resolved in this manner. Mediation has many benefits, not only for the parties, but also for our society as a whole and for the administration of justice. It is some more cost effective than uh, pursuing a full trial at court uh, these matters involve legal fees and there is a cost associated with administering justice. At the end of the day, the parties are the ones who benefit and I am sure that this point will be made over and over again because the parties are the ones who negotiate the terms of the settlement. It is not the court that makes an order telling the party what they are to. They are the ones who drive the process and determine the outcome. And mediation is a process that uh, preserves relationships within our communities and, as I said, assists in having stable relations within communities and within our society as a whole. Mr. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for having me this uh, morning. Um, as a trained mediator, I've been do practicing or doing mediation for the past 13 years and we, I have assisted disputing parties at the mediation level to settle their dispute and uh, mediation can and will, once it's done properly, will assist our society 
will assist the, the backlog cases at, at the court level and helping to preserve our society as a whole and having, helping parties come together to talk and help them to settle their disputes. Well, I've been hearing a lot about the benefits of mediation mm -hmm. and all of that, but exactly I think the public would like to know what is mediation and the process, how you get, get across that, how you decide what goes to mediation. Mm -hmm. Who wants to answer that? I'll take that one. Uh, mediation can be arrived at at the instance of the parties involved in the dispute. However, we're here to speak about court-connected mediation and in that context, mediation takes place primarily when the judicial officer, be it the master or the judge, decides that a matter before them can benefit from referral to a mediator. That usually takes place when the parties are before the judge or the registrar, either at the first hearing or at any stage from the commencement of the claim up to the date of trial. What the registrar or what the judge, sorry, or the master will do is to examine the pleadings. That is the case as set out by the claimant claimants and the case as set out by the defendant defendants. And then later on, after they have filed witness statements or affidavits, laying out their evidence, the judge or the master will have a better idea of the respective positions and would look at each party and say, this is a matter I believe can benefit and you are more likely, you're quite likely to be able to agree an outcome with the assistance of a mediator. At that stage, the judge or the master will make an order with the assistance of the parties directing that the matter goes to mediation. The judge or the master will ask the parties to agree among themselves the name of a mediator of first choice and also the name of an alternate mediator. In crafting the order, the judge or the master will make a stipulation that the parties are to attend mediation within 45 days of the date of the order. And that is how the process commences. If the parties wish more time and they report back to the court at the end of the 45 days, the court may extend the time for completion of the mediation. You said something that crossed my mind. You said um, well, the parties have a choice to choose the mediators, but how do they know who are the mediators? In each of the courtrooms here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, there is a roster of mediators and list of the names of the mediators who are trained and who have been appointed by the Honorable Chief Justice to provide this service for mediations which are connected to the court system. Mr. Kamara, you are a mediator. What are some of the cases or issues you have had to deal with? A number of accident cases, land dispute, boundary disputes. Um, on the civil matter, you, we don't do um, divorce matters, okay? But more so uh, land disputes, and I have handled a number, quite a number of accident cases. On that level, um, I would ask for the insurers to be present. And this is what I think I'm probably one of the few mediators who would handle those um, issues, that those matters like that. Accidents? Accident cases. I'll ask for the insurers to come up because at the end of the day, they're the ones who really settle the matter. Because they will have to, you pay in your insurance companies to cover you in the event of an accident. And I would request them to be present so that we can put a quantum on the table, if you will, for discussion. And as on that, we will go back and forth and try to resolve the issues and so on with that, those matters. What kind of disputes qualify for mediation, apart from what Mr. Kamara mentioned? Well, generally, uh, any matter can be referred to mediation. It depends on the parties and uh, whether they wish to pursue that alternative, as well as 
situations where the court examines the matter and determines that this matter can be resolved through mediation. So it can be perhaps a dispute in contract, uh, a conflict concerning the estate of a deceased person. Uh, Mr. Kamara mentioned uh, traffic accidents, land disputes, uh, just about any matter. Um, as I said, depending on the parties and depending on the way that the court looks at the matter. Is there a cost attached to this? Yes, there is a cost. Once the matter has been referred to mediation, each party is required to pay 400 EC dollars. That fee is paid to the court office to the person who is the mediation coordinator. Of that $800, the mediator is paid $650 as their fee, and the court office retains $150 for administration of the mediation program. Justice Henry mentioned uh, that the mediation session is for three hours. I think she did. So if the session extends beyond three hours, there is an additional fee of $100. If it extends? Yes, if it goes beyond three hours. So, so some people might say, maybe it's not my fault that it went beyond three hours. <laughs> well, that is all part of the process. Um, but the process is not one, I believe, where the parties, you know, attribute fault. It is a discussion and it may be ongoing so it may be that the parties have not resolved the issues within the three hours and that they require more time to think or to consider the options that they have. So it is a discussion and it may last more than three hours. So in that case there is an additional fee of $100. Uh, if the parties do not attend the mediation uh, the court can impose a fee if a party cancels without good reason. You know, in some cases, like um, the case is put off, the hearing is put off, and it, it drags on and on. Is the same case with mediation, or it, it operates differently? You have the three hours, and you have a stipulated time, like it has to be resolved within this period of time. If we go beyond the three hour period, and um, as I said, we didn't resolve all the issues and we grant an extension and there's still some issues unresolved. We can send it back to the judge and then the judge will say, okay, you need more time. I mean, I can adjourn a matter twice, okay, and we may still not resolve all the issues, but I would, they, on the form I would say we resolve some of the issues and we can then put an, what I call an interim, or it's called an interim agreement where we say, okay, we'll need some more time, but it may be going back to court next week. So we let it go back to court and then refer it back to mediation for a, an additional time to, to try and resolve. But it wouldn't take about a year, right? No. Well, no, it not, doesn't. Not at all, not a year. C can I add this also sure. in response to the question that you asked, Ms. Rose? The difference, one of the differences between mediation and uh, court hearing is that when a matter is set down, before with a mediator for mediation. That's the only matter set down for that particular time with the mediator. So the parties have the mediator to themselves for those three hours. The mediator has set aside those three hours. There are no other litigants who are going to come before the mediator at that time. So it's really up to the parties as to whether or not they would want the mediation to take place on that day and at that time the mediator will wait around, the mediation coordinator will wait around, I believe, for about 15 minutes to half an hour. And if one of the parties or both of the parties do not show up, that is the only reason why a mediation will not take place, except, of course, if the mediator has an emergency and, and for any other reason is unable to attend. When does this take place, the mediation? Mediation at present takes place at the High Court Office. And just to add on the point that 
this is one of the uh, advantages of mediation, the convenience to the parties, because the mediation sessions are scheduled at their convenience uh, in consultation with the mediator. So it is very unlikely um, that you will have long delays because the parties are the ones who determine when the matter is heard. The court doesn't say it must be heard on this date at this time. They determine the date. Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and Partners. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Mommy, mommy, can I have a snack, please? See, see, mommy, we're real busy right now. Just take a snack from the counter. No, mommy, that's having too much salt in it. Can I have a fruit, please? That's an interesting choice. But where did you learn that? The people on Hellwood. No, mommy, you want to kill me with high blood pressure? Help her say whatever salt you eat for the whole day should not be more than one teaspoon. And that is just for adults, you know. Foods may contain more salt than you think. Reduce salt intake. In our final segment this evening, early childhood education is crucial to a child's development. The government has placed much emphasis on this sector and continues to develop new strategies for increasing accessibility to the less fortunate. The API recently visited two early childhood centers operated by the government in rural communities. and two, the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines started investing heavily in early childhood education. This investment was included in the policy taken by the government to have universal access to education. 90% of a child's brain is developed by the age of five. So it is critical that um, children be exposed to early, uh, early childhood education during that four to five age group because um, this will lay a solid foundation for them for future um, education. Ms. Williams explains that there were some challenges in the rural and suburban communities pertaining to access to early education. To address this, an initiative was taken to attach early childhood centers to primary schools. In 2009, 75% of children in the rural and suburban had difficulties accessing early childhood education. So bearing this in mind, the government decided to build preschools in these areas for these children who were deemed at risk. Also, there was a low population in some of the primary schools at that time in the rural areas. So those are some of the reasons why they decided to attach these preschools to the primary schools. The first, the, originally they had decided to have one on the windward, one on the leeward, and five others in the rural areas. But today, there are 11 government early childhood centers across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
and there are plans to construct two more we in the near future, one in Bayabo and in Richland Park. Early childhood education centers are located in Ovia, Langley Park, Argyle, Canaan, Mariaqua, Fair Hall, Chumaca, Beckway, South Rivers, and Edinburgh. The one in Edinburgh it, that is currently serving children from Edinburgh, Atley Hall, Green Hill, Halls Avenue, even as far as Barley. Yes, but these children, they would, um, most of them would go to schools, primary schools in the capital when they would have completed their preschool education. Carmel Neblet supervises the centre at South Rivers. At the private preschool, the children would bring their lunch for care. They would pay a two fifty per week and that would give them lunch from the, the school kitchen. This system also makes the transition from preschool to primary school much easier. They are here already, so once they go over there, it's just, it won't be a problem for them. Just a, a smooth transition because they would interact with the other children already in the school, around the school compound. And with the, with the children who come, sometimes I allow them to come in to socialize with the children, so it won't be anything strange or new to them. Head teacher Sherin Wilkinson also agrees. The children are, are already here, so they are coming to the same place so in September because um, we have about 32 of them who would be graduating this year and who would be coming over to the primary school in September. They are coming to the same compound, so we are hoping that that would make the transition easier. Um, in September, the first two weeks of school was really stressful over here. A lot of crying, screaming, and so on. We are hoping that because they would be coming to the same compound in September, that we would not have that happening again. They would have been accustomed. They already know some of the persons over on the preschool. They know the kindergarten teacher. They, you know, they, they would have grown accustomed to being on the compound. So it would be a smooth transition, we are hoping. And here, they are already settled because the problems that we had in the first term, in the early in the first term, those did not reoccur in January when school reopened. So we are hoping that that would continue and then it would even continue on into um, September. We are hoping that the long vacation would not, they would not forget school during that time, but they would remember that this is where they come every day and that when they come back, we will just go along smoothly. The children are eligible for entry at the age of three. Like the primary schools, admission is free, which is a big plus for parents. However, Ms. Neblet would like parents to be more proactive. We are having problems with, you know, hitting. And then, rather than the parents, you know, you would say, okay, you, you make a complaint. You, you, you tell, make a complaint to the teacher. The child will go home and say, um, this person hit. And rather than, you know, you tell the child, okay, you make a complaint, they give you hit back when you go to school. So we don't have a problem with hitting, biting. Parents have been, you know, conflict rather than coming to the school to make a company, you meet the parents on the road and then you start to say, oh, tell this, you know, that, that way. You come to the school, you find out, and then you can talk to your child, you tell them, make a complaint, it's easier to make a complaint, let your teacher know what is happening and let the teacher, you can solve the problem here. This is not the only challenge faced by the centre which was opened at the beginning of the 2018-2019 school year. It has been quite a challenge to manage both areas, but um, I think that the teachers, they have been very collaborative, they are very cooperative, so that kind of makes the job a lot easier. Challenging in that you have the very small ones, the very little ones who are over here at the early childhood centre, and then you have the, 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 the primary school as well going along with, with that. So, it is um, challenging in terms of um, like the parents, for example, um, 
coming on to the compound, bringing their children. Sometimes it's hard to get them to leave. They come and they want to stay with the little That's ones the early at the early childhood center. So that has been a challenge. Um, also, when we plan activities, because we would have been accustomed to only have activities for the primary school, but now we have to include the early childhood center. And we have had one or two occasions where we were planning as senior management and we totally forgot the early childhood centre. And then later on, when we discussed the plans at the staff meeting, you would hear the teachers from the early childhood centre say, so what about us? What are we expected to do? So getting everybody to do what is supposed to be done sometimes can be a bit um, challenging. And then we have to tailor certain things. So, so for example, we have sports coming up. We have to find ways of including the students from the early childhood center in our sporting activities because we don't want them to feel left out. So those are some of the, the challenges, but we are working around them. The Cain End Early Childhood Center has been opened since 2009. Avi Stevens, head teacher at the school, says the initiative is playing the role it was designed to do, prepare the young ones for primary school. I think the transition is quite smooth because um, we don't have any complaints when children are uh, enrolled in kindergarten. So most of them from here go over there? Yes, this is our catchment area, our preschool. Preschool has just transitioned into primary. The supervisor at the centre here is a graduate teacher and she has um, some background in early childhood training. I think she does it pretty well. I delegate responsibilities. I supervise, I get involved into every activity at the school. So we just work together in a collaborative approach. She explains how it works at her school. Like the beginning of the school term, we will all meet together. We give our plans to the parents, I mean both schools, pre and primary. And uh, during the term when we have like specific activities, the early childhood parents will meet separately. But we do have activities together. Um, we have devotions together. We ha when we have our literacy activities, we include both schools. So we work together. I think because of my passion for education, it comes like, quite naturally. I, I manage quite easily with the help of my supportive staff. Like her colleagues in South Rivers, Mrs. Stevens sees this move by government as one with numerous advantages. One of the advantages is that um, it, it helps the parents. I know it helps the parents because um, you will find parents who are at home because they do not have the, the resources financially to help them to access the early childhood education at a privately run preschool. Because they, they can access it here, you find it will make them more accessible to, for, for job opportunities because they can bring their child here and then go and seek out job. Whereas before, they do not have a job, they cannot enroll in private, private run um, preschools, then they will be left at home. But this has helped them. Both the South Rivers Methodist and the Cain End Government Schools have signed on to the Child Friendly School Initiative. Cain End signed on since 2012. It was mainly at the primary level, but being the person I am, I have included the... the, the, the preschool. It's it, it built on the tenets, um, inclusive education, safety, and the biggest chunk is student-centered learning, where everything revolves around the child. Along with our child-friendly friendly thrust, we have designed a remedial learning center at the main building. One of our other activities is um, a behavior reward program. If we look there, we'll see where well, you have how, how high I'm flying today. <laughs> so it's a sort of strategy that we use um, to reinforce positive behavior. So everybody would start off on, on the blue. On the blue, the on blue, blue. blue in the sky? Yes. <laughs> and if um, some, you know, some, let's say, bad behavior, you might fly a little low and you put your name down. If you are really bad, you might fly way down low. But, but we, no, we don't focus on the bad behavior. It's just reinforcing positive behavior to get all children living well. Like anything in life, there are pros and cons to this initiative. 
but for those who are directly involved or benefiting, the pros far outweigh the cons. My name is Natasha Charles. Um, the school is it's okay, it's educational and everything, and it's, we are grateful that the government is helping us with the the um, so that we don't have to pay a, a fee. So we just want to say thanks, and the teachers are very good with the kids. On mornings, they would come prayers. We do circle. Um, they have their snack. We do an activity after. Sometimes we um, we go out to the um, playground. There's a playground at the back of the school. Read stories, do rhymes and so on. Sing songs. Sometimes we go out and we, rather than going on the slide, we play different games outside. I love my school. I love my children. Don't want to compare in a demeaning way. All I can tell them that. The government-run preschool is as equally good as any of the private schools that you think are highly recognized. Of course, obviously we would have some challenges, yes. but um, gains that we would have made. Most of our teachers in these government centers, they are trained teachers. When we employ teachers, we look for those who have been trained. So that in itself lifts the standard of the quality of education in these centers. And we would have been tracking children who would move into the primary schools from these government centers. And most of them are doing well. They would have had a solid foundation. And also there are more children, in, especially in the rural areas, who would have had this opportunity to have a preschool education. Otherwise, they would have been at home and they would have to wait until they have primary school age because remember, at these government centers, there is no fee. The children attend at no cost. Some of the challenges we are facing is in terms of space because more and more persons want their children to attend these government centers. Not only because it is free, but the quality of care and education in these centers are high. Most of the centers we have catering for a maximum of 50 persons, children in these centers. But sometimes we would find them um, our registration might go beyond that at a particular school and we are unable to accommodate all these children. So sometimes persons might be waiting for their children to get in to these centers. Hence one of the reasons why the government is building more centers so more persons can access this education. Our standards and regulations are not yet ratified. However, we, when we go to these preschools to do our monitoring and inspection, we try to get all of the preschools, both private and government, to work in compliance so that when these standards are passed, they would be already offering a high quality service. However, with the government centers, we ensure that um, the standards and the regulations are in place at these centers. Because as you know, the government schools are like models. They are the ones who um, have to lead by example. And um, some of them, the new ones, I may say, while they may have some teething problem, as you said, Anywhere you go on the island or in the basically you are going to see the same thing in terms of quality. It's a very high quality. We've come to the end of another presentation by the Agency for Public Information. We do hope you enjoyed the program. For more from the API, please visit our social media platforms at API SVG. I'm Hala John. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.